with the crisis of 2008, I knew that uh, North Dakota had its own state-owned bank. It was the only, only state with its own bank, and so I was watching. And at first, there were four states that uh, had no, or that stayed in the black. And then there were three, and then there were two, and then there was one. There was only one state that actually escaped the credit crisis uh, with a budget surplus every year and that was North Dakota. So then I started writing about it that I thought that their banking situation was uh, a major factor in that and that's when I got flooded with email and so it was more than I could answer so we formed a Google group so that people could talk to each other and that got to be quite active and after two years we felt like we knew the answers and it was time to form an institute which we did so so then these bills just started appearing for state-owned banks. We didn't actually bring them, but we certainly um, pushed them when we, we heard about them. And there was one in California brought by Ben Hueso in San Diego um, for a feasibility study for a state-owned bank. So, so 20 states have now introduced bills of one sort or another for um, state-owned banks. The one in California passed both houses of the legislature and Governor Jerry Brown refused to sign it. He said, we have uh, plenty of committees, we don't need another committee, we can do this in-house. But that was two and a half years ago and we haven't heard any more about it. So I decided to run for treasurer to get a fire under them to, to do this thing that they were obviously quite interested in since it passed both houses of the legislature. It wasn't a fly-by-night idea. And we had this great model in the Bank of North Dakota which has been doing it for nearly a hundred years and high, very successfully. Yes. The difference between a state bank and a credit union is that a credit union is owned by its members but it, it's really quite limited in what it can do that the big Wall Street banks have sort of manipulated the legislation and um, so a, a cooperative or a credit union has to compete in the local market with the other banks. It has capital issues, it can't make huge loans. A state bank on the other hand, or a state owned bank, takes the, uh, well the model of the Bank of North Dakota is that all of the revenues of the state are put in this bank and it's set up as a DBA of the state. So it's North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. So it's got a huge capital base and a huge deposit base and it can leverage that money into credit for the purposes of the state. So what North Dakota has done, which is radical, is to break away from Wall Street. They pulled their money out of Wall Street banks, that's where all, all state and local governments put their money because the Wall Street banks are the only ones big enough to handle the revenues of a state. They have to collateralize it, that's a long story, but it's not cost effective. Even if you split it up among many small banks, it wouldn't help the small banks. Where it does help the big banks because they use that collateral for their own purposes. They speculate in the derivatives market. Small banks don't do derivatives. Uh, so. North Dakota took all that money back, put it in their own bank, leveraged it for their own purposes, and the, the key is that they get the profits for the purposes of the, the profits returned to the people. So it's a huge money maker for the state and the state has control of where this credit goes. They can fund things that they support, particularly they make very low interest loans for um, startup businesses for farmers. They they used to have the best student loan program in the country. In fact, I think they had the first student loan program until now, it, you know, student loans have been taken over by the federal government. They still have a student loan program, but they were pioneers in this. So they their mandate is to serve the people and that's what they do. They have no motivation to um, to they get no bonuses, fees, commissions, they have no motivation to churn loans or they don't do derivatives, etc. They only do basic conservative banking that helps their, their um, economy. No local banks in North Dakota have been closed since um, the 2008 crisis, unlike in all the other states where these banks are either going bankrupt or they're being taken out, sold out to the big Wall Street banks because they can't afford the new capitaliz capitalization requirements.
in North Dakota, the Bank of North Dakota partners with the local banks and helps them with their capital requirements. So the, the Bankers Association endorses the Bank of North Dakota. They don't compete with these local banks and they have the most local banks per capita of any state in the country. Uh, the Public Banking Institute is, it was all volunteers until quite recently. Now it's gotten so big that we've had to hire some staff. Um, and it's totally nonprofit. It's a 501c3. And it, the website is at publicbankinginstitute.org, where you can find a great deal of information on who to hook up with if you're interested in promoting a state bank in your state. Uh, how how it's done, the history of public banking, and basically what's going on in the public banking movement. Uh, there are two possibilities. You can either persuade a politician to bring a, a bill, which is what happened in California, for example, with Ben Hueso in San Diego, or you could bring an initiative, which is what Colorado has done. They haven't pass the initiative, but actually I think the initiative is the ideal way to do it, particularly now that I've run for office and I see what an uphill ba battle it is. Um, if you, an initiative forces the legislature to do what the initiative says, assuming you're one of the states that does initiatives, but the problem with that, in California an initiative costs three million dollars because they give you so little time to gather the signatures you need that you have to get these uh, official paid uh, signature gatherers and you, you do have to do some advertising because you're going to have to stand up to the big banks which are probably going to do counter advertising. So if you can get a legislator who's interested, it's probably best to get, they have legislative attorneys who draft bills. So if you can persuade the legislator, he will get the bill drafted and there, there are various models. Actually we have some models on our website of different states, the bills that they have drafted. And then it's just a matter of uh, petitioning your legislators, getting them interested. Uh, typically legislators are very conservative. They don't do things unless they know that there's a big push for it. I mean, they're, they're opposed to change because it's a risk for them. But if there's a big groundswell of support for something, they'll go out and do it. Not only is interest a huge burden, but fees can be as much as the interest. And then we have these interest rate swaps, which um, are have been, they're actually fraudulent. With the, It's hooked up to the LIBOR scandal. The, the interest rate swaps are, ba the, the amount that the banks pay, it's quite, it's quite a complicated subject. But anyway, the interest rate swaps themselves have been proven to be fraudulent. I think they should bring lawsuits about these interest rate swaps. But, and then w there's one other factor, and that is that we now have bail-ins. Bail-in is now official policy in, in Europe, where, where if a bankrupt bank can hit up this pool of money to be bailed out by the, the nations collectively in the Eurozone, but before they do that, they have to take the money of their creditors, a certain proportion of it. And this is the shareholders, the bondholders, and the um, largest class of creditor of any bank is the depositors. Supposedly you're protected by deposit insurance, but that was the part they didn't agree, agree on in this bill or this uh, banking union that they just passed in March. So the depositors are left to the mercy of their local um, insurance, which in the more vulnerable countries is way underfunded, so there's not going to be enough money to pay off the depositors in the event of a system-wide collapse. And that's also true of our FDIC fund. And all the G20 nations have agreed to be bound by the Financial Stability Board, which set up this whole template for bailings. So the state and local governments could be losing their money along with everyone else for another complicated reason, which is that derivatives have super priority in bankruptcy, which means they go before everybody else, including the secured credit. Community banks are privately owned, and so, of course, there are some community banks that are actually doing socially responsible investing, 
which is a good, definitely a good thing. But the problem is they're relatively small and they have to compete in the market with the other banks and they have to compete with the big Wall Street banks. And under Basel III, the new regulations that are, again, supposedly correcting what went wrong in 2008, the capital requirements have been raised. They, they have uh, regulators breathing down their necks all the time. So, so it, it's a hard row to hoe for the small community banks, whereas a state or a city or a county-owned bank would have a much larger base to work with. The obvious obstacle is the fact that you will be taking uh, money out of Wall Street, both the investment money and the uh, deposits, which is a huge chunk of money for Wall Street. And we had the Move Your Money campaign, which was to, to pull your personal deposits out. And that had a fairly large effect. But just imagine if all the states pulled their money out. I mean, this, this is, we're talking real money. So they, they will fight, and we've, we've seen that already just in the legislation that we've had when you have court hearings. They have, they have uh, lobbyists who show up and they, they, they argue. But also there is uh, some legislation that people say prevents states from having their own banks, so uh, constitutional provisions, but I don't believe it. I think they've misconstrued those provisions, but typically constitutions say the state may not lend its money for private purposes, which is taken to mean that you can't have a bank that lends money. But if that's true, then you can't put your money into a bank in Wall Street that would lend it out. Well, actually, legally, when you put your money into a bank, you have lent your money. You become a creditor of the bank and they own your money. That's the reason that they're able to confiscate your money in these bail-ins. So technically, when you, if the state puts its money in a Wall Street bank, it has also let, lent its money for private purposes. There are infrastructure banks that's where states lend for purposes of building in infrastructure. We have one. Um, the California has one, and it says right on the website that they leverage their, the state's revenues for creating credit for these purposes. So I think they misconstrued the statute, but they're using it to block us from getting our state-owned banks. So if you had to, you could include in your bill that, that that constitutional provision would be modified. But I think a lawyer could easily argue that that's not what it means, or if it is what it means, all states already violate that provision. I'm definitely hopeful because I think it's really our only it's the only alternative that I see for fixing our banking system. Nothing really happens at the federal level. The, the Dodd-Frank Act, which supposedly fixed the, uh, the, made it so that we wouldn't have another collapse like we had in 2008, did not address the things that caused the collapse. So we could well have another collapse and we could have a bigger collapse. And the, the, uh, Congress at the federal level is is pretty much owned by the big banks. I mean, legislators have said that. So the only place that we really still have a voice and that we really can get some action is with our state and local governments. You could have not only a state-owned bank, you could have a city-owned bank or a county-owned bank, and there are cities and counties working on that. We have a group here in L.A. that's working on that. Um, the city of L.A. pays as much, there was a recent study showing that L.A. pays as much in banking fees as they pay in interest. And the interest can be half of the cost of anything you fund, or anything that's, uh, well, for long-term infrastructure projects, interest can be half the cost. For example, the Bay Bridge retrofit, that where the Bay Bridge collapsed and, and was rebuilt, uh, was supposed to be $10 billion. It turned out to be, oh, sorry, it was supposed to be $6 billion. It turned out to be $12 billion after interest and fees. The, um, the bullet train, the first outlay on the bullet train is supposed to be $10 billion, but after you include interest and fees, it'll be another $9.5 billion, so it'll be almost $20 billion. 
So you could cut the cost of infrastructure. These are like long-term loans. Just like when you buy a house, you wind up paying as much again in interest or maybe more. If you own the bank, then you would keep the interest. You get that money back. That's the way it is in North Dakota. That money comes back in the form of a dividend to the state. So if you own the bank, you can get infrastructure for half the cost, essentially.